let's take a look at the Asian markets. They're quite range bound. This is after what was a mixed handover from the Wall Street. As far as the vote share projections go, across 80 seats in UP, we're giving 57% to the NDA as per our survey, 26% to the India Alliance, 9% to the Bahujan Samaj Party. Supports on the Nifties, the 40-day exponential moving average. Watch on the downside, that is about 21,959. At some point of time, I think from the day's low, we could see a bit of a bounce. It, uh, you know, we'll have to see the durability of that. But from the day's low, I think we'll get a bit of a bounce. The PCR has hit that lower end of the range. I think we've got, what, uh, 21,943 coming up on the Nifty. See, uh, India businesses uh, of many multinationals uh, are growing very, very rapidly. Today is the calm after the stormy session yesterday. The Nifty and the Sensex are up in the green. Well, certain gold loans have been given without collateral. So that appears to be the key concern here. For higher capacity E3 wheelers, the incentive has been capped at 50,000. During this five year odd period, uh, you know, less than 65 rupees has been added to these Munreka wages, so to speak. It's a good looking screen for the bulls today. Some recovery from yesterday, but of course, all of it has not been recouped. Well, it's a day of relief after many, many days of uh, pain. That's how I think you uh, best put it in one line. Uh, that was a day so far. You're with us here in the next one hour on Closing Bell. We are coming to you as always from the CNBC TV 18 Moti Law School Studios. I'm Prashant. With me, my colleagues Reema, Surbi, Nigel, everyone is here and ready to go. Guys, hi. Good afternoon. I'd like to believe that this is the getting close to the weekend factor. Things generally start <laughs> looking up and getting better, right, as we get closer to the weekend. Nigel, what do you say? You know, people will be wondering, I mean, what are you all blushing about? You know, the markets are up only half a percent. But the real story actually is in the advanced decline ratio, right? We haven't had this sort of a breath in the market, I think, in the last maybe 10 days or so, where you have four and a half stocks advancing for every one stock that's uh, declining. But Surbi is clearly in weekend moon. Surbi, you still got a day and a half to go, so please control. Okay, I, I, will, I shall say no more. <laughs> All right, well, uh, we will say more, but uh, not right now. Uh, you know, let's just take a quick look at uh, what's happening with uh, the market, right? So there's a nice, decent 3% uh, turnaround for the small cap index. That's point number one. Uh, that's where the maximum pain was. 13 14% knocked off very quickly from the highs. And today is a 3% bounce. Uh, you know, the RSI in the morning, uh, the data we put out, had hit 24. The daily RSI, the relative strength index, had hit uh, 24. Now, that is as uh, oversold that it gets in the very near term, and there is a bit of a bounce, which is uh, not a bit. 3% is a decent bounce uh, that uh, we have uh, going on. Uh, mid caps as well, I mean, of course, I mean, the fall there was about 7% from the high, so the fall, the bounce also is, uh, you know, lesser than what we are seeing on the small cap index. We'll talk about what kind of stocks are bouncing in these two areas in a bit from now, uh, but uh, that's the uh, headline, really, the uh, headline right now. Uh, take a look at uh, <clears throat> PSUs, right? The PSU pack is making a comeback. PSC, CPSC, PSU banks, not so much. But uh, a percent and a half bounce uh, on broadly the uh, public sector indices. This is where a lot of the pain, especially yesterday and the last couple of days, was concentrated uh, in. Nifty is up a half a percent, which means it's actually off the highs uh, by a bit. Uh, and uh, 100 plus points, that's good going. Nifty bank, not so, not so much. Uh, it's uh, still, I think, uh, about 100 odd points of the, uh, actually more from the day's highest point, about 0.6, 0 0.7% of the day's high, 160 odd points lower on the Nifty Bank. So, as I said, a bit of a day of relief, especially in the broader markets, in the smaller stocks, small caps. Reema. Oh, absolutely. The mid cap index is up 1.5%, the small cap index is a gain of more than 2%, the micro cap index is rallying even more, and the advanced decline ratio looks solid with four stocks advancing for one currently in the red. Uh, but the banks have slipped a bit. You know, Prashant pointed out how the Nifty Bank is currently down 150 points. From the day's high, the Nifty Banking Index is down nearly 400 points. And pull up the intraday chart of an Axis Bank and you will see that sharp intraday slide. But even the other private sector financials, Indescent Bank, HDFC Bank is slightly lower. Uh, State Bank of India in the PSU lot too is a bit under pressure. Uh, on the gainer side, you've got Adani. They got hit hard last, you know, yesterday. Today, they've rebounded smartly. Adani Enterprises, Ports, uh, Metals and IT are the other two pockets where you are seeing some green. The Nifty IT Index is a gain of more than 1%, 1.5%. And Infosys is topping the charts there with a rally of about 2.6%. But you know, one index which hasn't recovered is the Realty Index. Even today, the Real Estate Index, the Nifty Realty Index is down in the red. And week to date, it's down more than 10% now. 
No, that's uh, that is the real estate space, but it also rallied a lot. So you know, it was one of the best performing sectors of 2023. Continued that good move as we got into the new year. Uh, so perhaps it's taking some more time. But the quick uh, sort of turnaround in the PSU stocks that has been perhaps the hallmark of trade on the large cap screen. Of course, uh, the bank Nifty is the one that's not only really playing ball, not uh, keeping up with the others, but even on large caps. I mean, it's more about the story is really about uh, the uh, the PSU lot. Uh, and then we're seeing that in Coal India, in ONGC. Some of them have good brokerage commentary also supporting both of these stocks, actually, Coal India and ONGC. And we'll get to that as we go forward. But the PSU bounce is, of course, uh, one of the big uh, talking points of trade today. And absolutely, uh, to Nigel's point, that uh, breadth, the chart of the advanced decline ratio, that's really heartening because three straight days we were struggling. Yesterday, it was only 100 stocks moving higher. Today, things have reversed. Today, you have almost 2,000 stocks that have been advancing right through the session. I mean, that's not really changed. And uh, the declines are uh, under 500. So uh, I guess um, the bulls getting a much needed uh, reprieve, Nigel. Well, that's right. You know, and Surbhi, earlier today, we had made this point, you know, at the Bazaar chat itself, that the Nifty, if it can defend the 50 DMA, it has a chance to rebound. The PCR had gone to that oversold level of around 0.65 odd. And if we just pull up the levels, we went closer to around the 50 DMA. From there, we saw a good bounce. Just take a look at that. The low of the day and the 50 DMA comes up for you on the Nifty. And the high of the day and the 20 DMA comes up for you on the screen, which in fact, we did a U-turn uh, from. So it appears as of now, there's a tussle going on. Will the Nifty break the 50 DMA on the downside or does it have enough to get past the 20 DMA, which during the fall was a bit of a support. So if we can get past that, maybe in fact, we'll have more firepower on the upside out there. Similar is the case with the Nifty Bank, by the way. Intraday, we briefly traded above the 20 DMA, but we met resistance out there and we're back below the 20 DMA as we speak. And the 50 DMA, you know, we went pat down to that 50 DMA and from there we bounced up. So the 50 DMA is becoming crucial both for the Nifty as well as the Nifty Bank. And that's precisely the point we made earlier today. For the time being, we have a bounce on our hands. You'll want, you know, a further up move crossing the 20 DMA on the Nifty. And then you'll say maybe we're good for more. But clearly portfolios are feeling much, much better today given the kind of bounce that we've seen. Mitesh Tucker joins in uh, to give us his take. Well, Mitesh, um, you know, you were sounding a little bit cautious on the Nifty. Do you think this is a bit of a dead cat bounce? You think we're still going to go ahead and revisit lower levels? If yes, will you go short on the index at these levels? Good afternoon, Nigel. I still am actually having a negative view on the Nifty. I did mention that there's always a, you know, a, a partial pullback of the big candlestick when you see it on either the bullish side or on the bearish side. And yesterday, you know, we had a high of 22,446 and a low of 21,905, so roughly about 540 point. And we've tried to cover about 38, 40% of that candle. So still, I think the indicator structure has a group. I think what can happen on the upside is that if we get an hourly close about 22,250, then I think, you know, we'll change the view. We have been short since yesterday, uh, near the levels of 22,380, levels. We're still maintaining that short. Uh, trail the stop loss about 22,250, maybe 10 points higher than that. And I believe that, you know, there's still a chance and there's still a stronger possibility of us eventually breaking uh, the levels of 21,800, 850 zone and then heading low. So uh, keeping that kind of a stance. Though what has happened is that a couple of IT names, you know, have uh, turned the tide. So I have a buy on Wipro, uh, which I would recommend buying with a stop below uh, 507, 506 half and uh, recommend a target of roughly around 530 over here. Uh, IT, as I said, is the stronger pack. And on the other side, you know, uh, a, a pullback like this uh, would be good to short uh, uh, possibly an uh, Apollo tires with a stop at 512 for targets of 475. Okay. And thank you. <clears throat> Sorry. Thank you very much for that. Let's talk about Hindustan Copper. The stock is higher in trade as copper prices have hit an 11 month high. 15 Chinese smelters have agreed to copper output cuts. Um, stocks like Hindustan Copper, as I said, are trading with healthy gains on the back of this development. Manisha joins in with the details. Manisha. It's been strong gains for the copper prices on Elmeet trading at a 7-month highs, in New York at a 16-month highs, and in Shanghai at a 22-month highs. So across time zones in the world markets, it is trading at multi-month highs. The gains come in on the back of a very strong demand right now, and there are some supply disruption fears as well. So copper prices have gained up by 4% on week and 7% on month as well. If you look at the inventories, while they have seen a surge in Shanghai, but they have declined by 32% on Elmeet that has 
has been supportive. The latest factor supportive is that 15 Chinese smelters, and this is really rare, have agreed to join together and cut production going forward. This is because when you look at the TC fees uh, of making uh, copper cathode from copper concentrate has really seen a very sharp decline. So last year it was $87. We started this year with $80 as well. And then it has seen a constant decline to nearly $19 in Feb and almost $12 in March and currently trading at around $3 to $8 a ton. Markets do believe that this could slide further and to protect those losses or to ensure that there is no more bleeding happening with smelters, this step has been taken. So near-term supply tightness, supply disruptions, decline in inventories are some of the factors that can continue to support copper prices going forward. Okay, got that. Uh, thanks very much for explaining those factors to us, Manisha. Surging copper prices, and that's spelled good news for a couple of the listed stocks here as well. Uh, Hindalco is one of them, which has been up about 3% or so. Let's uh, take the conversation forward. We have uh, Dilip Bhatt joining in on the show this afternoon. Dilip, always a pleasure to have you on. Well, let's start with some of these metal stocks. As we just heard our colleagues sort of talk about copper, uh, you know, that seems to be playing on the upside. What is your view on, uh, on a stock like Hindalco? It's not a you know, pure direct play, it's not a minor, so to speak. Uh, but uh, just in terms of the prospects from here on, given the way global prices are moving. Uh, good afternoon, Sulvi. I think uh, regarding copper, it was uh, for quite some time, we had been seeing that the demand is on the upswing and the prices also are on the upswing. So I think copper has been seeing a good uh, demand and the good uh, firm prices for now for quite some time. Maybe some of these uh, events have further led to the increase in the prices. So I think copper as a commodity still is better, but after all, it's a commodity without any doubt, and we generally don't take a long-term view of any of the commodities. But uh, coming to Hindalco, I would still say that uh, Hindalco, I think, will be a beneficial, but you know the way uh, uh, the subsidiary which is going to go in for an IPO and when that IPO happens, I think a lot of the core value of Indalco will get discovered and will get diluted. So our uh, broad concern still is that Indalco may not be a great way to play uh, the copper price rise because of some other factors, not necessarily the, the copper uh, as a commodity. Indeed, uh, Dilip, and there's only one way to play a copper price up move, right? That's Hindustan copper. Besides that, you know, we're playing on the TCRC with regard to Hindalco. No to that point. Thanks a lot uh, for that. Well, I want to know your view about Coal India. For the time being, let's uh, pull out, uh, you know, what Jeffries had to say. Jeffries, they wrote a note. They have a buy rating. They continue to maintain the target price of around 520 rupees. They believe that the recent dip on the stock, well, it's a good buying opportunity. The factors that they've stated are three broadly volumes, e-auction prices and valuations. Let's run you through those points. On volumes, they say that, uh, you know, to feed India's rising power demand, coal production will go up. And they are factoring 8% volume growth for this year. And for the next two years, they are working with around 6%. For FI24, their uh, estimates are more or less in line with what Coal India management has estimated in terms of production. But for FI25, they're a little lower than the 838 that the management has guided for. That's point number one. They believe volumes will be fairly steady. The second point is they are talking about that big fall in e-auction prices. That seems largely behind. Remember, e-auction prices uh, as a premium to FSA, that was at 200%. That came down to around 117% as of the last quarter's numbers. And in the first two months of this year, they are between 35 to around 50%. So they are not too worried. They are saying that they are working with around 50% for the next year. That's FY25. And that's more or less in line with the 60% average that we saw between FY11 and FY22 as well. And the third point they're talking about is valuations. The stock trades at around 8.3 times its forward earnings. That's at a discount in comparison to uh, the long-term average. And also it's at a sharp discount in comparison to what Nifty is trading at. It's at a 50% discount in comparison to Nifty. And normally they're saying on an average, it trades at around 16% discount. So three factors, volumes, e-auction prices bottoming up, and also they're talking about valuations. Dilip, do you concur? Well, I think Coal India certainly has uh, a reasonably good prospect ahead. I mean, if I were to say from here on, I would think that something like another 15-20% uh, price is possible, very much possible. Uh, I think largely because the fact is so very well uh, uh, spelled out over here. But my major uh, thing is that the Coal India was always very cheap and it will continue to trade cheap, not because of anything else, 
But because most of the PSUs do trade very cheaply, and nothing has really changed overnight, I mean, the DNA of all the PSUs still remain the same, and I would not make all India as an exception. So I would say that, yes, for a 15% gain for a big cap stock, it still means a good return. But otherwise, uh, PSU and a commodity does not really excite me so much. Uh, Adilip, uh, your thoughts on the latest uh, EV promotion scheme for two-wheelers and three-wheelers? There are two ways to look at it. One, you should be happy because in the current scenario, the incentives would have ended on 31st of March. At least now you've got a temporary extension of four months, although lower incentives compared to what you've had in the past. But then the others would argue that, well, if you're getting, you know, they were anyway expecting an extension. And now this time you're getting much less than what you were earlier getting. Uh, the stocks have come off from the highs. The, you know, the potential beneficiaries like Sona, Comstar, Una, Mindo, Un Uno Min Minda. How would you read this development? Well, very frankly, uh, you know, something which depends so much on subsidy and not on the core profitability, uh, and that too, uh, one is not very sure that how and when the subsidies are really paid off uh, to the companies. So I think both the combination uh, makes it uh, a lot more less exciting than what we think. I think uh, EVs are still, uh, uh, I think there's still a long way to go before it really evolves because things are still uh, undergoing a lot of changes and it keeps on evolving. So I think I would not take a bet on this particular sector from the current levels. Okay, uh, Dilip, stay with us. You know, what we'll do is we'll take a quick commercial break here. Markets uh, holding nicely, uh, 128, uh, 130 points, 22,125. We'll... Uh, Take that break. We're back. Rana Konkar, CEO, uh, co fund manager, equity and head of research at PPFAS Mutual Fund, will also be with us when we return. Stay with us.
Welcome back. Banks have extended the fall. The Nifty Banking Index is now down to 80. When we started the show at 230, it was a 150 point knock, and now it's fallen some more. There you have it. Uh, PSUs continue to rule the roost today. SJVN 17% up, ITI 15% higher. Railway names, Aircon, IRFC, Railtel, all these stocks are showing you some big double digit moves. But despite the gain today, they haven't managed to recover the losses over the last three days. Let's go across now to Nimesh to uh, talk about IPCA Laboratories. Nimesh had highlighted <clears throat> this stock as a standout brokerage uh, report in the morning, and the stock has done well, Nimesh. Uh, yes, Rima. So the stock is up 400% on the back of a big upgrade from HSBC. So today they've upgraded the stock to buy from hold and they've raised the target price to 1335. Now, HSBC believes, uh, and they see a notable, uh, you know, margin expansion for, for IPCA going forward on back of healthy growth in the focus areas, which is UK as well as India. And also they're, uh, they're seeing uh, easing cost pressures to add to the margins going forward. In fact, uh, they are building in an EBITDA improvement of over 470 basis points and, and a pad CAGR of 50% plus uh, between FY24 and FY26 estimates. So that's a big number that they're talking about. And they say that you know, the, uh, the, the, the pickup in the U.S. supplies will be the next big catalyst for the stock to outperform. However, they've also highlighted some risk, which includes uh, continued volume slowdown in the India market. So that could be a big risk for uh, IPCA going forward. And also from, a, from in the developed market, uh, some currency risk could be, a, could be a bit of a challenge, as well as you know, supply chain disruption. So while well, they see some risk on the horizon, but uh, given the risk reward uh, and on valuations, they, today they've upgraded the stock to a buy from hold. And uh, HSBC has raised the target price now to 1335 on IPCA. Okay, that's IPCA, and IPCA has been uh, in the green throughout. Nimesh, thank you very much for that. So that HSBC note is working well for this stock. Dilip, uh, any interest in IPCA? Have you had a look at it of late? Well, I think about a couple of months back when we were actually analyzing some of the pharma names, and I think IPCA, if I recollect properly, uh, we were thinking that the pad growth from 24 to 27 uh, we're roughly in the region of around 25 to 30 percent, that is the CAGR we are talking about, gather. And uh, apart from that, I don't remember right now, but that's a stock which probably has not done much of late, but certainly uh, merits a look. And I think certainly uh, we'll have a real look at it again, uh, because uh, IPCA has always been a very a pretty steady performer all throughout. Okay, all right. Uh... <clears throat> Thanks very much, uh, Dilip. Appreciate you joining in and uh, great speaking with you as always. You know, another name is Angel One and something we were, we've been discussing in the last couple of days. Uh, I mean, if you sort of sort um, uh, by what has lost the most in this correction from the highs, uh, Angel would sort of figure prominently. I'm talking about large liquid names, high growth names which corrected significantly. Angel fell from 4,000. Uh, to about 2400. I mean, the low was actually actually 23. Yesterday's low was 2330, uh, and uh, today there is a strong bounce back uh, at hand. Uh, and uh, I think we discussed this day before yesterday. Uh, it's on F5 25 expected earnings. It's now trading at uh, about 13 times, 13 and a half or times earnings. Uh, so that's uh, another interesting kind of name which I just wanted to highlight. Rona Konkar is with us, co-fund manager, uh, equity and head of research at uh, PBFAS Mutual Fund. Rana, good to have you with us here. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for your time. Uh, you know, everything happens in double time, quick time now. Unlike 10, 15 years back when, you know, corrections could be grinding, uh, long-winded, could take months. Uh, this is a quick service in that sense. Is it done is the question, though, uh, Rana. What's your sense? Is the excess out in that sense? Uh, thank you for inviting me, Prashant. And it's a very interesting question, which... Anybody can give any answer and it can sound right. So the problem here is, it's very hard to predict. Uh, what we do, and we try to avoid predicting this precisely by just focusing on the businesses we own in the portfolio. So if a few businesses are doing okay, the valuations are reasonable and they have a runway which we thought they should have over a period of time, then there is no reason to worry about whether there will be a broad correction, when it will happen, why it will happen. In fact, if it corrects and the business economics still remain the same, you can continue to buy at uh, reasonable prices. So we do tend to keep a little bit of cash at hand when we think the valuations are a little heated. At the moment, we're at 13% cash in the portfolio. Mm. So 13% uh, cash, what was it, say, six months back? Have you lightened your holdings in any of the mid and the small cap stocks over the last few months? And would you look to do a, a little bit more of that? It would have been more or less the same uh, range of cash in the portfolio. Uh, it wasn't uh, dramatically different. Uh, wherever we found a little bit of expensive valuations we have trimmed, 
But otherwise, we have been adding wherever the valuations are still reasonable. So net net, it's going to be the same. Do you want to tell us where you've trimmed your holdings and what made it to the buy list to increase your weight? It's the existing stocks we own. So some of the private sector banks is where we added a little bit. Uh, we also added to some of the smaller names in the portfolio earlier, which were high dividend yielding stocks. Some of the PSUs we added where we felt the valuation was still reasonable. And in the trimming list, there will be some cyclicals we had bought uh, for special situation in the past. We have trimmed those. Something like NMDC Steel or NMDC, etc. Uh, okay, got that. Uh, Rona Khai, good afternoon. I noticed that uh, you continue your you know big love with HDFC Bank, right? I think it's uh, still one of the big positions in both your portfolios, in the Flexi Cap as well as in the Tax Saver Fund, right? Uh, so what's the thought process? Because this, it's just been really trying investors' patience. So as money managers, I mean, uh, you're, you're still being patient. Are you, have you added more? And sort of how do you uh, deal with it from here on? A uh, deal with it is fine. It's very easy to deal with. Then you know that uh, there is a period of adjustment they will have to do uh, because of the merger that has happened very recently. We have to give them some time for the numbers to normalize. So that is one way of looking at it. The other way is to see whether the loan book is better or worse, say, compared to five years ago, whether the uh, expansion of the branches that they're going to do is better or worse than five years ago, whether uh, other initiatives like having the management aligned. So we have a change of management in the company of this size. Uh, does it work out in the favor over a five-year period? Some of these longer-term trends are something we want to monitor rather than waiting for the valuation to keep going up in a short period of time. So yeah, patience is fine. But on the other hand, business metrics also should uh, demonstrate over a period of time. So we will wait till uh, the numbers uh, either be become better or worse and the valuations remain uh, wherever they are based on the numbers. All right. Hi, Ronak. Uh, good afternoon and good to see you. When you're in the peers, you'll have added some of these private sector banks, as you mentioned, HDFC Bank, Kotak Bank, as well as, I think, ICICI Bank. All three of them, I think you'll have added some weightage in the last one month or so. The other big heavyweight that you'll have had is ITC. You know, and there was some weakness. The stock corrected close to around 20% from the recent peak in the anticipation of this block. You'll have added on positions there as well, right? In the past, we did. Not recently. Okay. All right. ITC uh, remains to be a big part of the portfolio. Big part of the portfolio. And the other couple of names, I think, is EID Parry as well as Power Grid. Have you added positions over there as well? Yes, so Power Grid we have added maybe recently. Uh, EID Parry also a while back we added, it started uh, in the last couple of months only. Interesting. One more point, uh, Ronak. Uh, you know, y'all were playing, I think, the Bajaj story via the holding, uh, Bajaj holdings. Over there as well, uh, you know, you'll continue to play the Bajaj holdings. I think Bajaj uh, group companies like Auto as well as Bajaj Finance by the holding company. Have you increased positions there as well, Bajaj holdings? So in the portfolio, we already had Bajaj holdings as a very sizable uh, portfolio position. But we also have Maharashtra scooters as a small position. So yeah, we still do hope that the holding company discount is something that allows us to buy this at a cheaper valuation. And we do want to buy it through the holding company rather than buying the underlying. <clears throat> right. Uh, just one quick uh, point before we uh, we're going to talk about the. Uh, I think uh, you, you guys must also be busy with, busy with the stress test. Surbi is going to uh, sort of you know give us a heads up in just a bit. But one thing on the flex in the flexi cap fund, uh, uh, you know, uh, Ronak, you know, with the fall that we've seen, have you uh, and you're sitting on some cash? Have you found up new of stocks which were which have come off? Uh, which you've tracked, you like the businesses, but valuations were un unpalatable and now become attractive or not really? Not really attractive. So a lot of companies stay in our grocery list of what we want to buy at a certain price, but none of them are at a range where we say suddenly, okay, now we go and you know, put all the cash into action and buy those companies. That time has not come yet. Okay, all right. Now let's talk about the stress test, uh, the mutual fund stress test results, which we, I think we should get tomorrow. Surabhi, uh, tell us more. Okay, so I'm going to try and simplify it as much as possible. Uh, I think most people know it, but for those who've kind of missed out on this, uh, why are stress tests happening? Because there was a dialogue between SEBI and the mutual fund uh, industry about the possibility of a little bit of excessive risk building up in small cap funds and in mid cap funds, because that's where all the money has been gushing in over the last couple of months. So then uh, the body decided to get together and say, okay, let's do these stress tests. Actually, they are an ongoing phenomena in the mutual fund industry. Now, SEBI says the results must be made public so that investors can figure out uh, whether they should be investing any further in small cap stocks, mid cap stocks or not. So what is a stress situation? That's the first thing. This is being described as a situation where there are two conditions. One, 
only 10% of market participation is available to a mutual fund scheme. When I tried to understand what that means, what is 10% market participation, one interpretation was that instead of, let's say, you know, 100 crores of total turnover, there's only uh, 1,000 crores, there's only 100 crores of turnover uh, on that particular day with that particular scheme. The second condition is when trading volumes are three times the normal, trading volumes on all the individual scripts that are part of a portfolio. So this is basically the definition of a stress situation. So now what do mutual funds have to do? They have to check how quickly can they liquidate the portfolio and basically meet the redemption request that might be coming in on such a stressful day. So they have to declare how long will it take, the number of days it will take to liquidate 25% of the portfolio and 50% of the portfolio. Uh, please remember the end objective is very simple. SEBI wants to ensure that if it is a high stress situation and if investors are asking for redemptions, if they want their money back from these funds, they get their money. That's the sum and substance of it. Interestingly, these tests are not going to take into account the top most illiquid securities in a portfolio, which comprise up to 20% of the portfolio weight. So it's a little technical, which is why, Ronak, I wanted to come to you. Uh, you know, and it's a two-part question. One, just explain to us this concept of 10% market participation. What does this mean? That's the first part of the question. And second, if you're not going to consider 20% of the most illiquid securities, then what's the point of the, tread, the stress test anyway? I think I don't have the right technical definitions for what you're asking. But what I can understand from what you just said is uh, the concern is about liquidating the portfolio over a period of time when redemptions happen in a gush. So if it is a small and mid-cap kind of a company where anyway the volumes are very, very thinly traded as compared to larger companies, then that's the reason the stress test is used so that people are generally aware of how much time it will take. And like you correctly said, this is an ongoing role anyway. So this is not something where uh, suddenly the mutual funds have to comply to this and st start testing the volume and redemption rate rates that they have seen. It's going to be an ongoing uh, way. And I think for illiquid securities anyway, most companies have a large number of stocks in the portfolio. You can't have uh, just a concentrated portfolio of few stocks. So the portfolio along with that also can be liquidated over a period of time. So it's not necessary that just because the liquidity conditions are poor for these companies, you cannot liquidate them over a period of time. Of course, there might be a correction, the price might be different, but these are all hypothetical things. So technically discussing them is very difficult. <laughs> well, we'll have to discuss them because the results are going to be out. I mean, some people say by tonight or maybe early morning tomorrow, and then we have to make sense of whatever these results say. But is there some, <clears throat> you know, they said that the number of days it takes to liquidate your portfolio, right? 25% and 50. Suppose we get a number, it takes 10 days, it takes seven days. What would constitute a risky proposition for an investor? Is there some, you know, broad, you know, fence sort of a number that you can give us? I don't think we can generalize that. So it, different people will have different time horizons of how they have invested in these schemes based on their investment requirements. So I don't think we can generalize whether 10 days is risky or five days is risky or 100 days is risky. So the first thing is we need to interpret them very carefully. It's not something where one number suddenly means something has changed dramatically. The nature of the companies will remain the same. Uh, the valuations people will pay will change based on their expectations. But I don't think the number can be given Say for you, it might be five days is more risky. For me, it might be 350 days might be more risky. I don't know. So it's a different No, no absolutely. Yeah, no, no. Ronak, take your point 100%. And I think that is where the regulator is coming in from. They disclose this. So if someone has put in their hard-earned money in a small cap fund, they should know that if they want to get their money back, assume it's going to take at least 15 days if you want the whole money back or if the fund suddenly has to sell. Basically, just it's another number that uh, investors can use to gauge the level of risk and whether they're comfort, uh, comfortable with it or not. So take your point completely. Thank you very much for uh, joining us today and giving us uh, thoughts on your portfolio and, of course, all the other <coughs> trends out there. Uh, so, you know, there's another thing. There's a, in this entire thing, right, there's a bit of a, uh, how do I put it, uh, reflexivity involved in the sense that mm. this is to test extreme situations. Yeah. Mm. And say there is a crisis, mm. right? First thing which disappears is liquidity. Yeah. So you, when you start to decide to sell 25%, mm. uh, as you sell, the number of days will go up, actually. Mm. So this is based on average daily, whatever average daily volumes or, you know, whatever mm. what you can sell based on pr previous nice. data. But in the, when that actually happens, yeah. You know, you create your own uh, uh, lack of liquidity in that sense because you, you come to sell. And as we saw yesterday, for example, yeah. right, 
on sharply down days, liquidity uh, disappears. There are no buyers. So, so that is exactly <coughs> the point. And even yesterday with uh, Mr. Prashant Khemka and then we had Nilesh on the show, uh, we were, I mean, I was asking them the exact same thing because it's exactly for those kind of scenarios uh, that these tests are being done. Now, yesterday, most of the mutual fund houses were at least telling me they were not getting redemption pressures. There was, in fact, more money coming into a lot of funds, large caps and even mid-cap and small caps. But what if on a down day when you have 2,000 securities declining and suddenly a fund house gets a huge redemption, so you know, then, then who will buy? How will that fund house sell? That's exactly what yeah. they want to do. No, I think uh, the regulator just wants more yeah. information out there. And uh, I mean, that's all you can do. I mean, you can't uh, forecast what's going to happen. And then based on the current uh, situation, how many days it will take, uh, but, uh, you know, we'll see. We'll get the data and, of course, we'll analyze that as we go along. But, uh, you know, on to uh, something uh, <coughs> uh, sort of interesting. Uh, uh, opinion poll by C uh, News 18 across 242 uh, sort of uh, seats, Lok Sabha seats, shows the NDA could likely garner a whopping 174 seats and a major chunk of the voter share in the coming elections. Uh, election talk, election fervor is going to increase as we get into the general election phase. But all doesn't look too uh, gloomy for the India alliance either. My colleague Parikshit is here with key, key takeaways from the CNN, uh, from the News 18 opinion poll. Parikshit, take it away. The Lok Sabha elections are just days away and News 18 has conducted a pan-India opinion poll to capture the mood of the nation. Now, before we reveal the details, here is the methodology. More than 1,18,000 people were polled across 518 Lok Sabha constituencies in 21 states. Essentially, the poll has covered 95% of the Lok Sabha constituencies in the country. Now, let's look at the projections in some of the key states, starting with the biggest prize of them all, Uttar Pradesh. Now, as far as the vote share projections go, across 80 seats in UP, we're giving 57% to the NDA as per our survey, 26% to the India Alliance, 9% to the Bahujan Samaj Party. Now, as far as uh, the seats go and who's winning and who's not, 77 or a clean sweep for the NDA, two for the India Alliance and one for the Bahujan Samaj Party. Let's also look at the state-wise numbers across 242 seats which were surveyed. Let's get you the big numbers right here. Uh, out of these 242 seats in Bihar, it is advantage NDA with 38 seats. Kerala, uh, advantage the India Alliance with 18 seats. As far as uh, the NDA goes, it is likely to open its account with two seats. As far as Madhya Pradesh goes, uh, it is advantage NDA with 28 out of 29 seats. In Tamil Nadu, the survey suggests that yes, uh, the BJP and the NDA may open its account, may do well with five seats. India Alliance holding sway in Tamil Nadu with 30 seats. In Haryana, a clean sweep for the NDA. Remember, Haryana is a state where the BJP has made a lot of changes in terms of Manohar Lal Khattar going to fight from Karnal, uh, Lok Sabha seat, Nayab Singh Saini being made the chief minister. Let's talk about Punjab. Here it has advantage India Alliance with eight seats out of 13 and three for the NDA. In Himachal, the survey is suggesting a clean sweep for the NDA and the BJP at four. Delhi, this is a state where the BJP has changed six out of seven candidates from 2019. And here, we're told that it is an advantage NDA with seven seats. Uttar Pradesh, this is a big price, uh, 77 or a clean sweep for the NDA out of 80 seats and just two seats for the India Alliance. So we've got you numbers for 242 seats and 174 seats is where the NDA has a big advantage and it seems to be winning right now. So this was uh, the result of our survey on day one. We will also be getting you numbers from the rest of the Lok Sabha seats this evening and the big national picture. So tune in for our special coverage at 7.30 p.m. this evening where we will get you more analysis and a complete national picture at 9 p.m. Election fever gripping us now. We'll slip into a very short break. Parisha, thank you very much uh, for joining in and explaining that. On the other side, we'll get you a check on what dealing rooms are saying in our segment D Street Chatter and also some technical calls.
Welcome back. You're tuned in to Closing Bell, and we are coming to live from the CNBC TV 18 Motilal Oswal Newsroom. Well, uh, you know, a couple of stocks actually are going on with solid gains. You have Chola Investments as we speak. That's uh, recovered close to 5% from the low point of the day as well uh, as we speak. So just pull up the intraday chart. And the Nifty is not doing too badly at around 22,150. I think it's a good time to get in. Nimesh, Nimesh, tell us the screen is looking much better. Yesterday, people would be skipping yeah. a heartbeat. But today it's green on the screen. Portfolios will be feeling good as well. What are the flow pictures like? Oh, absolutely. So no, a good recovery, but it was more from an oversold position. So uh, this was very much expected as well. We looked very oversold yesterday. The PCR had fallen to 0 0.65. And uh, again, you know, from a flow perspective, I understand today you might see a buy figure from the FIs. I understand there is a small uh, market at close basket buying as well. So need to see uh, what the institutional number is. Uh, a, a big liquidity event is tomorrow, which is the FTSE rebalancing. That will lead to uh, almost $1.5 billion of inflow. Of course, large part of it is in the HDFC bank. But even then, outside of HDFC bank, we'll see a decent inflows in very near instant select names. So that is a big event to track. But you know, just, just look at uh, the, uh, how the things have panned out uh, since yesterday. Uh, I just want to give, give a uh, you know, bit of a perspective on what happened yesterday and what the reasons why markets fell, right? One, of course, was the advanced tax. That seems to be now behind us. Now, whatever they, who need to sell, they had to sell. So that's, that's over. The stress test for mutual fund was another reason people are alluding to that will come to a, that will come to a closure either today evening or tomorrow. tomorrow. So even that will come to know pretty much. Uh, again, even from a uh, from a liquidity point of view for the uh, retail and HN investors, whatever uh, you know that to square of the positions for the March end that seems to be largely getting over. So even that you know that's got played out. So from here uh, for the markets to fall, there has to be some really big news. Uh, maybe uh, the one speculation about uh, the electoral bonds and the details there that could be a bit of a a knee-jerk reaction for the market, so that needs to be watched. But on the positive side, as I, as I pointed out, the FTSE flow would be a big, big, uh, you know, thing to watch out from a liquidity even point of view. Uh, we've seen a bit of a uh, pullback as well, short covering as well in some of the PSU names. But within the PSUs, I understand this is going to be very selective now. Even today, there are mixed flows from the larger institutions. The only sector which stood, stood out was metal names. A bit of short covering as well in the names like Hindal, uh, Hindustan Copper and Nalco. But broadly, the the, the feedback seems to be uh, the the key uh, risk. For the, for the markets to fail seems to be largely behind now. We need to see how, whether this momentum can sustain. And to uh, uh, post the FTSE rebalancing, it needs to see how the institutional flow, flows pan out. Uh, indeed, a couple of headwinds out of the way, yeah. which gives us a better runway. Yeah. All right. Uh, but what about individual stocks, Nimesh? What are you okay. picking up? So in terms of individual names, the first stock on my list uh, today is uh, Sundam Clayton. There is a large block. The stock is marginally under pressure today, but there was, uh, there was a large block. 7% equity got changed hands. I understand the promoter entity was a seller in today's block and a leading h &I investor from South and a couple of domestic mutual funds were buyers. So the disclosures could be quite interesting as far as Sundaram Clayton is concerned. The second name is Infosys. Within the IT name, this stands out purely on back of strong flows. So expect very high delivery volumes in Infosys and I understand some uh, FI interest is back in that particular name. The third stock is PTC India. Uh, that, is, uh, that, is, that stock is up 7-8% in today's trade good volumes as well. I understand some bit of uh, you know, uh, flows are positive at, at h &I desk. But uh, from a trigger point of view, uh, all eyes will be on the EGM on 28th. Uh, that is when uh, the deal for selling the stake in PT, PT Center Financials uh, could be closed. So they'll, they'll get a lot of money uh, from the deal closure. So that is a trigger for PTC India. The last name is BLS International. That stock has locked at 20% upper circuit today. It fell sharply yesterday, but sharp recovery in today's trade. And I understand a leading FI investor uh, was a large buyer in today's block. So even disclosures in BSL International could be very interesting uh, because the stock is locked at 20% upper circuit. Okay, thank you very much for that. I was wondering why BLS International is up 20%, um, leading FII buyer there. Uh, let's move on. Paytm Payments Bank, mandated by the Reserve Bank of India, will cease operations such as accepting deposits, processing credit card transactions from tomorrow. Ritu, who has been following this story now closely, joins in with more. Ritu. Well, tomorrow is that big deadline for Paytm Payments Bank to wind down its banking activities as per RBI direction. So now the focus really shifts on how the linked businesses get impacted or how they pivot. And we've been given to understand that the National Payments Corporation of India, or NPCI, is likely to grant Paytm a third-party application provider or TPAP license very soon. It is expected later tonight, but no later than the 15th March deadline. That is going to allow Paytm to continue uh, allowing its customers 
to use the app to make UPI payments. Now, so far, Paytm's UPI transactions, if you recall, were handled by Paytm Payments Bank alone. But now, the UPI, uh, UPI handle, which is currently at Paytm for users, will be migrated to other banks once it gets this license. We had also reported this earlier that Yes Bank, Axis Bank, HDFC Bank, and SBI are among the four banks that are likely to come on board as payment service providers, or PSP, which means these PSPs will facilitate electronic payment transactions between various parties that use the Paytm app. Now, Paytm has already moved the nodal account to Axis Bank to help settle these UPI payments, and it is also in talks with other banks. Remember, the payment services, uh, that forms more than 60% of Paytm's revenue stream as of FY23. So it is an important segment that will be protected with this TPAP license. If you look at Paytm's UPI operations, it is the third largest app for UPI payments, and as per NPCI data, they processed 1.41 billion out of 12 billion transaction volumes in the month of February alone. So we're talking about a close to 12% share. Uh, you know, but as far as the banking activities are concerned, uh, we've been given to understand from our sources that RBI is not inclined to change its stance. And so any further relief is unlikely. Okay, thank you very much for that. Important information coming in on Biocon Biologics, where they've signed a 10-year collaboration with Eris Life for their branded formulation business. The stock is up close to about 7%. We'll try and get more details, but the stock is spiking up with this collaboration with Eris Life. Mitesh is now back with us for a few BTST calls. Mitesh? So I think um, you know the market has kind of held on the bounce back. So we'll go with one bank, one sell. Excel Bank is turning weak. Uh, you know, the banks were holding out nicely in the last few days. But today there's a breakdown. So STBT here with the stock at 1068 for targets of 1040. And uh, on the uh, buying side, you know, I've been recommending uh, uh, IT names. I think that's a space which uh, looks strong to me. So persistent is a BTST with a stop below uh, 8300 for targets of 8390. Okay. Uh <clears throat> All right, uh, you know, Bi uh, Biocon is surging. It's up about six and a half, as Remo was pointing out. Uh, we'll have the intraday uh, sort of chart come up uh, and uh, at about 269, 270 now, uh, pushing up. Uh, just take a quick look at what ha what else is happening. The Nifty, by the way, is also surged. We are back, not quite at the day's high, but not very far either. The high today is 22,204, and we're at about 22,162. So there is, I mean, uh, I think uh, over the last, uh, what, uh, uh, you know, 15 minutes or so, a, a recovery which is kind of set in from 22,100 at about three o'clock, just under, just before three o'clock. Uh, there's a 60-point rally which has uh, come in in the last 15 Even minutes. Even the mid-cap so. index has moved to the day's high, and so yeah. has the small-cap index. So the mid-cap index now is up, uh, approaching a thousand-point rally, mm -hmm. and the mid-cap index has gained more than two percent. Absolutely. Well, we'll take a quick commercial break here, but as we do that, listen into what Harsha Upadhyay of Kodak AMC had to say about the recent uh, sort of market volatility and uh, what he's making of it. Listen and take that break, we're right back. At this point of time, uh, probably uh, wherever we are seeing excesses is the pocket that is correcting more than uh, the overall market. So to that extent, uh, some of the names that we like on a fundamental basis are yet to reach those levels where we could probably deploy all of this cash. Economic growth continues to be very strong. Corporate fundamentals continue to be strong. The only issue with the market was the high valuations. Clearly, uh, the momentum is broken. The market breadth, as we have been seeing over the last couple of uh, trading sessions, has turned really weak. And that shows that uh, there is clearly uh, nervousness across the market. Probably it's fair to say that we are unlikely to really pull back into newer highs uh, immediately. But uh, uh, what's the time frame? It's really difficult to say.
Welcome back. You're with us on Closing Bell. Well, we have Ambrish Baliga with us on the show. Ambrish, uh, great to have you on. Good afternoon. Uh, so let's uh, talk about the pick that you have in mind. Uh, which one is it today? Uh, my pick is Tata Alexi. Uh, it's a preferred uh, ERD, which is engineering research and design company uh, uh, to leading manufacturers, uh, OEMs and tier one suppliers. And this space has been going at about 13% CAGR. And by 2026, uh, it should be a $72 billion opportunity. And uh, Tata Alexi, in fact, is growing at about 20% CAGR, uh, in, uh, like over the last uh, three years. Uh, present, it's, it's in fact present in strong segments like uh, automotive, telecommunication, uh, media and uh, entertainment, consumer electronics, and healthcare, which is mainly medical devices. And uh, they're also playing a major role in the autonomous uh, driverless uh, vehicles technology. Uh, for Q3, it was a decent performance, although the sector overall didn't, didn't perform too well. Uh, Tata Alexi grew at about 12% uh, Y and Y, and the operating margins have been stable at about 30%. If you look at the deal pipeline, it's extremely strong. So I'm expecting a revenue CAGR even going ahead of about 20%, uh, with a PAT CAGR of 25% in the next three years. So expected EPS is about 200 for FI26, and uh, my expected uh, price target is about 9,000. Mm. What about something like a federal bank and the latest RBI diktat that they can't issue more co-branded credit cards? Now, I was just seeing some data. In nine months of FY24, co-branded partnerships accounted for 77% of their credit card issuance. So it's been a fairly successful strategy. Though as a percentage of their overall loan book, it's not very high. Abhishek tells us it's at 1.4%. Do you expect a big impact on federal bank? We've already seen the stock lose 1.5-2% today. Sentimental impact, yes, to a certain extent. As far as the bottom line is concerned, I don't think there will be much of an impact. And we've already seen uh, this stock underperforming uh, in the past about a month, month and a half. So I don't see much of a fall from here. In case it comes uh, below those levels of 140, I think it's a, it's a, a decent buy. Even at the current levels, it's a, it's a decent buy. In fact, I have a price target of about 170 to 175 uh, over the next couple of months. Okay. By the way, uh, Ambrish, uh, there's some flashes at the bottom of the screen. Centers formed a committee, uh, t and uh, terms of reference uh, for the committee include institutional reforms within the NPP. We're talking about the pharma and the medical devices industry. The committee is for pricing framework for drugs and medical devices. Uh, so that is the uh, news which is coming through. Now, uh, more details uh, in just a bit with our <coughs> a reporter. Price yeah. and availability of essential medicines while providing the incentives to the industry to sustain growth and exports. Mm. So balancing price and availability of essential medicines, how to design price moderation framework for medical devices. Mm. Again, while providing incentives to the industry and also providing a price moderation framework for emerging and precision therapies. Yeah. To, so uh, sounds so. like some controls, right? Uh, look, I mean, we'll have to get details. Remember, on the devices side, things like stents, uh, you know, heart stents and uh, sort of knee implants, uh, the government in the past has come out with uh, sort of, you know, regulations and price caps, etc. Uh, so we'll have to see exactly what they're looking to do. But this is on both sides, medical devices and uh, drugs as well, which is pharmaceuticals as well. Uh, that is the information that is coming through. This is all source-based information. Uh, recently, of course, uh, for the hospitals, there was that entire uh, Supreme Court directive to the center asking them to regulate uh, standardized sort of procedure uh, rates, etc. Hospital stocks had taken a bit of a knock, and I think there is a little more coming through right now. Amrish, uh, you want to sort of weigh in on this one? Uh, we just, of course, reading this out. This is news just coming in. All sources, uh, source-based. Go on. Uh, I think the government clearly is uh, focusing on the sort of inflation which you have seen uh, as far as, uh, uh, I mean, uh, hospitals and healthcare uh, of, uh, sector is concerned. In fact, if you look at the Indian inflation in that space, uh, is about 14%. I think it's the highest in Asia. So, uh, uh, like, it's, I think it's decently clear that uh, the government wants to clamp down on uh, this to a certain extent. And uh, surely it's going to affect that space. We've already seen the hospital space getting affected. Now uh, I think we'll see the devices space getting affected to a certain extent. And uh, the two names which come to my mind is clearly Moripen and uh, Nureka, uh, which are into medical devices. So I think uh, they would get affected to a certain extent. 
poly medicure, right? That's the other one yeah. uh, as well. We don't know, uh, but you know, we'll have to see. This is just, I mean, the committee set up to discuss the uh, discuss the issue, and the, we know the uh, broad terms of reference, but uh, very very uh, early days. But take your point, Amrish. Sir, we. No, absolutely. And this ah. time, uh, <coughs> while devices, of course, they've been doing in the past, but even the terms of reference of this committee, uh, they do mention procedures. Now, what sort of procedures and, you know, how? Because uh, I think, as Tim C was telling us, some of this is uh, state subject. Mm. So let's see how this uh, plays out. But for what it's worth, the, the committee is going to take three months. So maybe uh, the government will go and ask for additional time uh, for this exercise to be completed. Uh, at the apex court level as well. Amrish, uh, before we sort of uh, sign out, just want to get your thoughts in on uh, PSU banks because we got that uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, news that uh, the gold loan portfolio has to be monitored. So basically, there's a, there's a fair amount of regulatory scrutiny and sort of tightening the screws, uh, so to speak, going on. How would you look at PSU banks? Would you still buy after the decline that we've seen? No, I mean, I wouldn't buy at this part of time. In fact, uh, I, I mean, I was, I think, one of the first few people who talked about buying PSU banks about three, three, four years back. But then at these levels, I'm finding them too expensive. Uh, they had become more of trading bets than investment bets. And the momentum was there. I think that's cracked right now. So whatever you see in the PSU banks now will be, uh, will I think, be basically a bounce back uh, because uh, uh, of the sort of correction which you've seen in the past few days. But then I think that should be utilized to book profits than to buy fresh. Uh, Amrish, uh, we leave the conversation here for now. Thank you very much uh, for joining in. Uh, counting down to the close of trade, and it's been a good session. The market after yesterday's storm has calmed down a bit. There is a rebound after three days of hectic selling pressure. The Nifty ending above 22,100, 22,140, a 140 point gain. Not at the day's high, we're off about 60 points from the day's high, which was 22,200, but still clocking in a pretty decent rebound of 140 points. Sensex up close to about 300 points. Mid caps were shining, the small cap index up more than 3%. The advanced decline ratio upbeat at nearly five stocks advancing for one in the red. Banks, though, particularly the large cap private sector banks, took a bit of a backseat. They did see some buying over the last three days. Uh, but today, you are seeing corrections set in in the likes of, you know, an Axis Bank, an HDFC Bank, an Indescent Bank, and the Nifty Banking Index was down 0.4%. Okay, let's talk about the big recovery that we've seen on the mid-cap screen. 2% higher on the mid-cap index and lots of gainers from the PSU space. They've come back with a bang, really. Look at SJVN as we're ending. Big volumes on the stock, 16% higher. Uh, IRFC is back to its winning ways, 13%. You've got Aircon, 12%. In the Sun Copper... Hoodco, Railtel, Yuko Bank. The short point is that it's across the board. Uh, railway stocks, yes, for sure. But even other names, I mean, a lot of the PSU banking names have uh, done well. And some of uh, the other stocks uh, also on the upside, on the uh, on the power side of the screen. And, and the large caps as well, we've been discussing. Coal India has had a good session. ONGC has had a good session. So basically, plenty of uh, movers and shakers from the PSU space on the upside. Non-PSU, uh, perhaps a couple of stocks that we can point out. Actually, these are the, the smaller uh, cap names. But if I talk about large stocks, uh, then some of the Adani Group stocks have had a good bounce back. Adani Green would be one of them. Uh, up and about, uh, JSW Infra is up 10% today. Uh, IRB Infra is up about 9-10% as well. So even on the non-PSU side, uh, you know, private sector, mid-cap, small cap names, uh, good, good day and perhaps a sigh of relief. Mm, absolutely. And, uh... You know, maybe a, a few other names, right, before we uh, wrap up. Yes Bank, by the way, was up about 12%. Some of the largest volumes, I'm talking about XPSUs, X Railways. Electra was up about 14%. Uh, we, of course, discussed in the Sun Copper. Solar Industries, big move, about 13, 14% uh, today. Uh, you had Rico Auto, 20%. I mean, started 10% higher, ends 20% in the green. Action Construction started 10% higher. The Crane Company, 20 19% on that one. Uh, Execom, which is the recent listing, 20% uh, on that one. Stock ended at about 212. There was Texmaco Rail, which is up, which was up uh, uh, 16, 17%. And I can go on with a few others, but this is uh, the large volume-led list. Five is to one, as far as the advance to decline ratio is concerned. Uh, and the Nifty ending with about 150 odd points uh, in the green. Not at the day's high, but not uh, very far away. Either. It's a wrap on this edition of Closing Bell from all of us here. It's goodbye. Thanks very much for staying with us. But Markets Forward will pick up on all the action in just a bit. Stay with us.